Now we're going to handle some questions from the audience. If you have a question on a card, you know, uh, pass it to one of the people walking uh, up the aisle. And also in the interim, if you have uh, some time to fill out the survey that's on your chair, uh, we'd appreciate if you do that so that you can deposit that on the way, on the way out. What is the correct duration of treatment to be given after you see a rash, two, four, six weeks? I don't think there is a correct duration. I can tell you that the published relapse rates with uh, doxycycline for 30 days, the clinical relapse rates run about 16% for doxycycline and roughly 19% for ceftin, cefuroxime. So when I see an erythema migraines, I look at it as an opportunity to treat the person a little bit more aggressively. I usually will... Um, not want to miss the opportunity to nip it in the bud if I can, so I'll treat with a month or six weeks and then have them go off and maybe do another cycle and maybe, maybe even a third short cycle or something like this. Okay. I'll uh, just treat a little more intensive. Thank you. Uh, how do you know when your chronic Lyme is cured or put into re remission and the remaining symptoms, aches, pain, brain fog, etc., are permanent damage or if they're permanent damage? Okay. Um, okay. So there's several parts to that question. Uh, in terms of how do you know when Lyme is put into remission, I usually, you know, if you're looking at things clinically, I mean, remission to me sounds like lack of symptoms. That could be defined as remission or cure. How do you know when Lyme is gone from your body if you are asymptomatic? That could be difficult to assess. There's not a good test to show when Lyme is still in the body. You know, in the animal studies, they cut the little animals up. In the people studies, they don't. So we're not really sure. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, and are the symptoms, the remaining symptoms, oh. permanent? Well, in terms of joint damage. stuff, you can find out if there's uh, permanent joint damage by doing an x-ray of a joint and find out if the joint is eroded. In my experience, it's uncommon, except for patients who've been treated with immunosuppressive drugs for long periods of time. In the studies of, you know, when they go back, Dan can speak to this, Dr. Cameron can speak to this about um, prior steroid administration is a, a risk for treatment failure, and those are the people that I see that have had the worst joint damage, is people have been treated with steroids before they knew they had Lyme. What supportive therapies, herbs, vitamins, acupuncture, sauna, there's also a rife question in here. Do you advocate current, concurrent with long-term antibiotic tr treatment for Lyme? Uh, there, there are tons of like herbs, vitamins that my patients take. And, uh, you know, even those in my practice that don't have Lyme, it's a high use of alternative medicines, complementary medicines for almost every illness. I myself find it's, there's so much work in making a diagnosis, getting through the emotional side, the, the mental side, the, the physical exercise side of Lyme. I concentrate so much on that diagnosis, support, you know, primary care things that I, I uh, have them work through the, um, alternative doctors, I tell them, listen, go ahead with all of those things you can to uh, help your immune system. I use probiotics all the time. Um, if someone's been sick for a long time, like months and months, you know, there's, there's so many people who are good at helping the immune system. You know, the, all the alternative physicians, the, the, the acupuncturists, the uh, massage therapists, there's so many healers out there that I tell them, listen, you get out there and try to, you know, also exercise, do whatever you can to try to get your body back into balance. So there's many different anecdotal informations that, and many of my patients love uh, adding something extra for their body. So I, I encourage them, uh, just there's no one trick if somebody's been sick for a while. Okay. Uh, can neurological chronic Lyme symptoms like memory loss, difficulty with words, et cetera, be reversed with medication? or treatment? Um, I find that, um, that neurologic problems like memory concentration, irritability, fatigue, s sleep, where they keep waking up all the time, it looks neurologic, but so often that an antibiotic pill works that I'll almost always work with doxycycline, work with amoxicillin, um, maybe use uh, uh, azithromycin. There's so many strategies, but in the end, at least 10% of the time, at some point I'll be using the intravenous ceftriaxone. So I always feel that even though they might have neurologic, why go to IV all the time when so often uh, you can just get on with a, a pill for those type of neurologic issues. Okay. 
Since fibromyalgia has most of the same symptoms, how would you get a correct diagnosis? Um, I like to always uh, quote when it comes to fibromyalgia, this study by Don Dr. Danta, he studied Gulf 4 syndrome people and found that when you come back with Gulf 4 syndrome, there's a certain package of symptoms. It's the same list as fibromyalgia and the same list as Lyme. So if you just study the symptoms, you can get a match with, with fibromyalgia really easily and accept that diagnosis and in the end, a year later you might realize, gosh, it's the same list as, as a Gulf War, or same list as chronic fatigue. And uh, so I always feel that, you know, that instead of knowing, stopping at any one diagnosis, at least include Lyme disease a second time, think about it, ponder it, and could Lyme disease be the answer after all? Could Lyme disease be the answer even though you've had your 21 days of treatment? So it's just a matter of keeping an open option not cut off treatments. If fibromyalgia treatment is what you start with and it's not working, then revisit Lyme disease. Um, can you explain why patients become more symptomatic when treated? Are toxins released as the bee are killed? Yeah. The Herxheimer is a, a complicated process and it's, I think, oversimplified. People always talk about Herxheimer's as killing Lyme bugs, you know. If it's truly killing Bibidorferi, how much Lyme can, have, can somebody have in their body? You know, can the person with chronic Lyme, if they keep getting Herxheimer's over, let's say, months and years, you figure if I'm killing it, I'm killing it, I'm killing it, I keep flaring up, how could there be so much left over? You know, isn't it dead already? So I don't think that's what's really going on. I think of what a lot of what we perceive to be Herxheimer's is not just death of the organism, but rather it elaborating components of itself, blebs and things like this. Blebs are like um, microbial dandruff, and they shed under stress and a live organism can shed blebs and the body reacts to those and, uh, and it produces increased symptoms. So I think that's what's really going on and are they toxins? I mean, it, Lyme has an endotoxin like uh, chemical in it and the body reacts to that so it's kind of like a biotoxin. Um, what's the downside of long-term antibiotic use you know, they uh, treat antibiotics in livestock, and uh, they treat antibiotics obviously in hospital settings, and they're finding that most resistant organisms, those are the areas that they're coming from, not so much the, the uh, outpatient uh, Lyme disease population that we're aware of. So the studies of Army personnel, when they've treated with penicillin-type uh, antibiotics, the flora becomes sensitive again once they stop the antibiotics within 30 days with penicillin derivatives. So, Yes, you can have antibiotic resistance. It typically goes back to normal after a period of time. There are some antibiotics like quinolones, which antibiotic resistance does not go back to normal. Again, quoting from the Army studies. So with drugs like doxycycline, tetracycline, et cetera, not only does it not cause much of GI flora disturbances and thereby antibiotic resistance, it's not used for anything, really, except for tick-borne illness and acne. So it's not like when someone gets a urinary tract infection, the first thing you want to put them on is tetracycline, or if they get septic from a, a ruptured colon or something like this. So I think that the risk-benefit ratio is way in, in favor of treating if someone's actively symptomatic with Lyme.